Hi, Jerry. Hi, Hi Jerry. Hi. Hi. How are you? Uh, okay. It's really weird to do uh, Zoom talks. You don't get the <laughs> feedback laughter I crave. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We could put a track in there, a laughter track. Oh, okay. <laughs> the good thing about this is, at least about this one, is that Jumbo and I uh, and myself are all the time on the call and are muted, so don't worry. At least you'll get some. You'll so get some laugh, laugh from both whenever you can. <laughs> <laughs> Hope there's some good jokes in there. Uh, should be so. Um, I guess something will come up to let me know I can share my screen with my PowerPoint. Yes, give me one second. Okay. Is this lighting bad? How's that, is that good? Yeah, oh, it's perfect, don't worry. All right. I think I'll, we'll just wait a little bit more in case people join. People always <laughs> join like yeah. five minutes after the start yeah. time, so. Yeah, so we should wait, I guess. Perfect. Um, in the meantime, we can just kind of get the, are you able to share a screen right now, Jerry? Uh, I just made him co-host. So, oh, perfect. So I could do that. Should I do that? If yep. you want just to. Just yeah. uh, get the okay. title screen up, uh, might be nice. Now, let's see, I'll move this a smidge. Oh, share. There we go. Uh, let's see if I put that to the first slide. Oh, perfect. <laughs> okay, great. Now we're just waiting to surpass or to get to registration numbers, and then we can start. Vincent, <laughs> is that your ideal scientist, Jerry? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> That's the original. How many people do you usually get? Um, it so varies a it lot. depends on the situations. Um, we get sometimes like 55-ish, um, but if people are quite busy, this is sort of a hybrid um, format where we also record it for people to watch oh, so yeah we forgot to ask yuri can we record you <laughs> are you okay with that of course of course <laughs> okay. um it's a yeah as jd was mentioning it's a hybrid format which allows people to also um join in our youtube channel um so that people can go back and listen to it while they're working or walking so sure no fantastic yeah, because so do, do you want to know anything about me before we start, or does that matter? Um, yeah, I'd love to hear something. <laughs> well, uh, I could, uh, I've been working at the BC Cancer Agency uh, for over 40 years, so I'm the second longest person in the whole cancer agency, which includes the other, me. Clients, other hospitals. The only one who's been here longer than me is Connie. Oh, and wow. Con Connie's the one that hired me. I'm her first postdoc. Wow. <laughs> amazing. You're still like working just right it next is, to each other. It yep. is amazing. <laughs> and, uh, I'm working because uh, A, I have a fantastic team. Make, it makes it wonderful to work with. And also I'm very lucky that I'm, I'm passionate. And mm -hmm. I'm gonna emphasize that's important. Yeah. Find an area that you are really passionate about. Of course. Right? It's of course. just a job. Of course. Um, yeah, I mean, it's same for me and for a lot of people too. I, you know, I don't know if the same for everybody, but for me, it's like science is almost like a form of art, right? Um, yeah. How you sort of visualize a discovery. So um, for me, it's rather than work, it's just sort of something I want to kind of carve and be creative with and sort of make my own so yeah um, I think that's what's really fun about um, I mean I guess like we always say JB we're just really lucky to like actually make a job out of learning and we love learning so <laughs> that's like the greatest <laughs> part 
my first postdoc, I, I did two postdocs, was in uh, UC Irvine, Southern California. And a guy came into the lab and he was a hippie. I used to be a hippie too, by the way, but we won't <laughs> go into that. But he had made his living making leather belts. That's what he did. And so he came into the lab and he said, I can't believe I'm getting paid to do this because this is what I want to do. And it was mm -hmm. a wonderful philosophy he had. He was always happy because he's getting actually yeah. paid to do research because, <laughs> you know, wow. Yeah, I mean, you know, I would say most, I mean, I would say all, everyone in at least the Terry Fox department, if they were financially okay, they would be doing this for free. Um, exactly. I mean, I, <laughs> I don't know. I don't see anyone complain. I don't see anyone going like, oh, another day I have to come in. So, yeah, um, yeah I, I really, you know, it's yeah. an environment that I really do enjoy. Okay. Yeah, it's too bad that COVID's put such a damper on everything. Yeah, and also like limits like person to person interaction. Sometimes you could just like talk more to more people, even about the yeah. topic either research anything and like now with the mask it's a little bit awkward you don't know if the person is smiling or has know, a... i'm a little hard <laughs> of hearing I, I didn't realize for many years i've always been a little hard of hearing and uh now that people are wearing masks i realize i've been reading lips for a long time <laughs> <laughs> i know i know yeah. can't hear anybody anymore yeah <laughs> Okay, so we have a steady stream of people coming in now. Um, yeah, I think, we I think we'll get, get started. started. Um, there's always late stragglers that will come in um, time to time. And Laura will keep an eye on anyone who's trying to join. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming uh, to another episode of Science Made Casual. Uh, today is a um, very special episode with Dr. Jerry Crystal. Uh, I think he gave a fantastic introduction <laughs> about himself, a true veteran of our department. Um, and really, it's an honor to have uh, Jerry here. Um, with my other account, I will have the Slido here. Um, if anyone wants to ask questions to Jerry during uh, this talk. And today is special because Jerry actually has a presentation, um, a full talk about what it takes to become um, a good scientist. And you can see in his picture, this is his ideal scientist. <laughs> <laughs> this is what you want to become. Um, <laughs> and so um, really, uh, it's an honor to have you here, Jerry. Um, and the mic is yours. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so first of all, I, I'd like to applaud all of you for being interested in research. It's a very hard profession, as you probably already know. You wash a hundred dirty dishes, you get a hundred clean dishes, but you can do a hundred experiments and get nothing. So before I get into what it takes to become a successful scientist, I've been asked to give a little bit about my own history. So, whoops, oh, I guess I gotta do it this way. Okay, so this is my career in a nutshell. Um, there's a famous book called The Drunkard's Walk and it kind of typifies the randomness of my career. So I was born in Brighton, England, which is right on the southern coast, um, a long time ago. <laughs> and my, my mother dressed me as a girl until I was three years old. Here's an, I'm on the right here, Morris and Geraldine. She wanted a girl desperately. And uh, whoops, that didn't work. Oh, sorry, got to get used to this. Here we go. Isn't that a lovely picture? Anyway, that probably did not affect my career path because my father put uh, his foot down and I finally got my hair cut at three. Oh, I got pressing the wrong button. There we go. So um, I was a happy child, always laughing. And there you are, that's in the Brighton beach with my older brother. Here I am laughing again, Black Rock, also in the, around Brighton. And it was probably because I was an idiot. I was never very smart. <laughs> Here we are. 
On the last voyage of the Aquitania to Canada, we landed in Halifax. When my mother saw Halifax, she immediately wanted to go back to England. So in Brighton, we started school at three years old. At four and a half, we moved to Montreal where I had to stay at home until I was five. And then I had to actually repeat kindergarten. So you can imagine the shame of that. But I became the best triangle player. So that was something. I don't know if you ever played the triangle. It's quite a skill. <laughs> Fantastic <laughs> instrument. So Montreal was very rough for little boys with British accents. We got beat up. That includes my brother. We got beat up a lot. <laughs> Look at that old car. So uh, the padding helped. So <laughs> I used to cope with getting snow pushed down my throat and neck. Uh, by hiding in my head. And I've kind of done that ever since. I became very introverted and I would just escape all the uh, traumas by uh, spending a lot of time in my head. Anyway, I remain happy. Can't say the same for my older brother. I love that picture. Uh, he was, uh, he took things a little harder than me. Anyway, my mother used to say, this is true. You were such a good looking baby. What happened? And she also used to say, you may be smart in school, but you don't have the brains for everyday life. Oh. <laughs> and this actually might have affected my career path. So anyway, I graduated from Baron Bing High School. Baron Bing was the only uh, member of parliament who was at the time uh, brought before the courts because of fraud, whatever. Anyway, we went to that high school, not important. Very um, important high school, a lot of famous people went there. Um, and uh, I graduated a very young 16. I worked for a year as a life insurance underwriter. That's where you look at medical reports and uh, lifestyle reports to determine the rate that they should have to pay for their insurance. I worked a year to get enough money to go to McGill and I saw a lot of, a lot of medical reports <clears throat> which got me interested in biology and medicine. I graduated from McGill, honors in biological sciences. I applied for a Quebec scholarship. They were very rare, very lucrative and I actually got it. Uh, so for grad studies at Berkeley in the Department of Molecular Biology, that department had seven Nobel Prize winners. It was like the premier department in the university. So anyway, while I was waiting to hear back on my Quebec scholarship, I went to work that summer at the Marine Biological Station in St. Andrews, New Brunswick, tagging swordfish. Uh, and fortunately I was not seasick, which was great, but my parents forgot to forward my scholarship notification to me and so I lost it. It went to the next person in line because I didn't make the deadline. Nonetheless, I still went to Berkeley until I ran out of money. I lasted about a year. Here is me being a rebel on my little motorcycle. <laughs> uh, anyway, I returned to Montreal broke uh, and I wanted to be a technician at McGill but I was encouraged to do a PhD by the head of the cancer unit because of my marks, et cetera. And uh, since a person who was supposed to go as a grad student did not arrive, so there was an empty slot. Now here's an important picture of my youth. These are my two best friends growing up. I'm the one with the glasses on the left. In the middle is Harvey Artsov. He went on to become uh, one of the leading virologists in the country. He was the head of the level four facility in, in Winnipeg. There was only one level four facility. He worked with Ebola and all sorts of dreadful viruses. And on the right is Bernie Lucht. He went on to become uh, the executive producer of ideas on the CBC and had a very illustrious career. So there's the three of us, very intriguing. Um, so anyway, graduate studies at McGill, that's the McIntyre Medical Building where I spent, as you'll soon find out, many years. 
So two years into my PhD, my advisor was fired. The cancer unit was closed. I stayed there, the only person on the whole seventh floor for another year by myself. I ended up publishing two very nice papers until an ad hoc committee was put together to decide my career. And they suggested I write that up as a master's and find a new supervisor for my PhD, which was very upsetting because I already had a postdoc lined up. Anyway, I chose the incoming new head of biochemistry at McGill, spent the next five years getting a PhD in molecular virology, studying real viruses. One, and so it took nine years to get my PhD. <laughs> so I, I say that to, uh, to encourage you not to give up. So things can go wrong, but I learned a lot of techniques. I broadened my base of knowledge. So it wasn't all bad. Anyway, let's look at my notes to see if I'm forgetting anything. Okay. But virology, Jerry, that's way different than. I know, <laughs> I know. Your lab does right now. Strangely <laughs> enough, I'm working with viruses right now, yet again. So, anyway, when I was in my last year, at uh, McGill, this picture came out in the first edition by Watson of Watson and Crick. Uh, EM pictures by Oscar Miller and Barbara Hamkello. And they were amazing. The one on the, the right here, that's a stranded DNA with a messenger RNA coming off it and ribosomes attached and making little proteins. And that's also shown here. And I said, oh my God, we can finally see what we've been working with all these years. And so I thought, wouldn't this be a great, I was a, I guess for a better name, I was a protein biochemist. I knew how to purify proteins from my master's and PhD and work with them. So I thought we always purify proteins based on their enzyme activity. This would allow us to purify proteins based on seeing them by their structure. And I thought that was great because there were a lot of proteins that did not have enzyme activity. So, I headed down to UC Irvine, and there it is. They have the anteater as their symbol, and I spent about two and a half years there, learning electron microscopy, another whole area. And when I was down there, I applied for a National Cancer Institute of Canada Fellowship for, for my postdoc time with Barbara Hamkell. And I was interviewed by Lloyd Skarsgård here at the BC Cancer Agency. Some of you may have heard of that name. There's the Skarsgård Award. And indeed, I got the fellowship. And he liked me so much, don't know why, uh, that he invited me to come back for an interview for a job when I finished. So after two and a half years at Irvine, I started a second postdoc with Connie, uh, her first postdoc. Uh, as I mentioned. And my job initially was to purify erythropoietin. Now back then, everything was just conditioned media with dozens of different growth factors and cytokines. We had no idea what was going on. And when I arrived, just to let you know how tough things were, this was the current assay I had to use to determine if I was purifying erythropoietin. It was called the polycythemic mouse assay. What you do is you take two mice, you bleed them, and you take their packed red cells and you inject that into a third mouse. So they have so many red cells that they turn off making more red blood cells. And then you give them what you think may be erythropoietin in your urine mix to start with, and you fractionate it and see where the activity is. If you have erythropoietin, even though they've stopped making it, the erythropoietin will force the animal to make more red blood cells. Red blood cells have hemoglobin, hemoglobin has iron. You could put in iron 59, a very nice dangerous radioactive chemical. I put in iron 59 ferrous citrate injected into the mouse. And then two days later, I pull out the blood, and I looked to see if there's any radioactivity in the red blood cells. 
So every assay, even to do a very simple fractionation into a few fractions, I would need about 200 mice. So I said, well, this is, and not only that, but the results were so variable, you had to do five to seven mice for each point, never the standard curve, et cetera, et cetera. So it was absolutely dreadful. So I decided I have to come up with a better assay. So this was published in 1983. So this changed the whole field, not just for my lab, but others as well. It was a very simple assay. Instead of this in vivo assay, I developed an in vitro assay where I just gave mice, you only have to give one mouse a little phenyl hydrazine that lysed a lot of their mature red cells. So their spleen got tenfold bigger to pump out new red cells because they're anemic now. So you could just take that spleen from the one mouse, divided it up into a whole bunch of little tubes, and they were all trying to make red cells. If you give them erythropoietin, they can now make red cells, and you could do a tritiated thymidine assay. It was wonderful. So finally, I had an assay, and then I went on to purify erythropoietin. This is a wonderful story. This is my first little group. That's Paul Sorensen, who now has a lab of his own in the building. Alice Mewey has a lab at Jack Bell, uh, a great little group. And um, actually Bert Wagnum, who also works at Stem Cell now, developed again another assay of the first ELISA for erythropoietin that we, we were the first to develop that as well. Again, changed the whole field. That allowed Amgen to make erythropoietin based on our assays and our purification procedures. And we could have been Amgen here in Vancouver, by the way. We were two to three months behind them. Amgen made all their money selling erythropoietin initially. Anyway, so uh, let's, we were able to use that assay. And this was a fascinating story because uh, Alan Eves, you all know Alan Eves, of course, Connie Eves' husband, uh, he would, get aplastic anemic urine from patients with aplastic anemia and he'd bring it back from Vancouver Island all over the place and I would use my assay to determine if they had high erythropoietin levels in their urine and then I developed this purification procedure to take it to pure purity and he would sell it so we combined selling erythropoietin. And there was another person called Paul Yeager, who's long since retired. Unfortunately, he's probably long gone too. And Alan Eves, by mortgaging his house, second mortgage, he started stem cell technologies and his first products were erythropoietin and media that Paul Yeager made. So I'm happy to say I played a big role in getting stem cell technology started, so that's very nice. Now, the big problem with purifying, purifying erythropoietin is it was extremely sticky because of its sugar residues on it. It's stuck to plastic, it's stuck to glass, and it quickly you lose it as you're purifying it. So I tested all these detergents, and this was the answer. Adding 0.02% tween 20 allowed us to purify it to homogeneity. That made such a huge difference. So my big competitor was Gene Goldwasser in University of Chicago. He brought in a postdoc from Japan who came over with 2000 liters of aplastic anemic urine, lie off lies, not as bad. And uh, he got a far lower yield than I got with only 20 liters because of this tween 20. Anyway, that's long ago history. That's uh, my first postdoc. Rob Pankratz, who helped with the purification. Now, once we had pure erythropoietin, we could start looking at signaling, which was my big passion. In fact, one of my claims to fame is I was one of the first people to actually look at uh, signal transduction in the hemopoietic system. So what we did, Rob Cutler had worked with he was another postdoc. He had worked with Michael, Go uh, Michael Smith. So he had learned site-directed mutagenesis. And this is the erythropoietin receptor. It has eight tyrosines. He changed each one individually to a phenylalanine so he could see which 
intracellular proteins with sarcomology two domains as a bound to which of these. So that led to lots of wonderful papers. During this study, we found there was a polypeptide, 145 kilodaltons that was involved. It was also involved in interleukin-3 signaling. We were looking at that too. So we set out to purify this guy. This is a whole other saga. And finally, we purified it to homogeneity, cloned it, and this was the protein. We called it SHIP for sarcomology 2 containing inositol 5 phosphatase. Turned out to be a wonderful protein. Uh, and its main job was to um, reduce the PI3 kinase signaling. So it destroys PIP3, brings it over here. And that led to many, many papers. Wonderful thing. I won't go into too many details. We found, uh, we, together with Keith Humphreys, we generated the first knockout in the Terry Fox lab, which was the ship. And many, many papers on what it did. Basically, if you increase the activity of SHIP, you reduce asthma, allergies, yada, yada, yada. And also you could reduce uh, the growth of cancers. So that was very lovely. Anyway, enough about that. Took up far too much time. So now let's get into something more exciting. Oh, before I leave me, <laughs> in 2009, I went to a Monday noon seminar on PET scans. So here I am, I'm a godfather of SHIP. I could have stayed in that field, totally happy, totally funded forever, but I was captivated. I, I, in this talk, there were actually a series of three talks. They talked about positron emission tomography, PET scans using a derivative of glucose, radioactive deoxyglucose, and you could detect tumors. And of course, that brings us all the way back to an old study from the 19, late 1920s by uh, Warburg. And that's the Warburg effect. And that's rapidly growing cancer cells take up and need more glucose than normal cells because they switch from using the mitochondria for oxidative phosphorylation to glycolysis for lots of good reasons for them. And that got me really interested. And so I asked myself a very simple question. Can you lower blood glucose sufficiently with just dietary changes to slow tumor growth based on their needing more glucose than normal cells? And of course, some of you hopefully will know that's led to a whole change of direction. And I now have a very wonderful group, Sarah, Michelle, Ingrid, and Hossein, and Ingrid, Eliza. Elysia actually is in control of the lab now that are of COVID and I'm mainly at home and she's done a marvelous job of keeping us going. So that's where I'd like to end my story and now get into the much more important story of what it takes to become a successful scientist. Okay, so, all right, here we go. So I kind of indicated that in research, you basically fly by the seat of your pants. It's kind of an entrepreneurial thing. You gotta get grant money. You gotta write grants, get grant money to keep going. And if you're in academia, it's a publisher parish. You could spiral up or spiral down very quickly. If you can't publish, you don't get grants. You don't get grants. You can't get research done. You can't publish. So it's very scary. If you go into industry, you gotta come up with patentable products. So uh, it's exhilarating when you discover things and it's very depressing when you don't. So I've been in research for over 50 years, which is a lot longer than any of you have been alive. So I thought I would share something I've learned over the past 50 years. Here we go. So, okay. Now, normal when you're a, a graduate student have tunnel vision. You're given a project, you want to learn about that area, and uh, don't do that, okay? Learn the area, but don't have tunnel vision. Go to TOS, go to the Monday noon talks that I organize, okay? <laughs> learn other fields. You might actually become passionate in a field other than your own that you're ensconced in. So it's very important to keep an open mind 
okay? Learn everything you can about the area you have a passion in and ask good questions. I know people are, especially students, are very scared to ask questions, but get over that. You can, it's very easy to say, look, I know this is probably a naive question, but blah, 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 blah. okay? Ask a question, don't be shy. It's very, you know, we got into science because we're social misfits, basically. But you have to try and overcome your introversion and be, uh, I'll talk on that again about the importance of becoming more extroverted. Okay, so not all questions you're gonna ask are good questions. So this is just a, a nice example, a not a good question. Okay. okay, and not all ideas you come up with in research are gonna work out, as you can see here. So here's where I should be listening for some laughter. So you gotta help me out here, you two. Give me you some you, laughter. <laughs> okay, thank you. So these are the funny ones. Okay, and for many reasons, research is gonna take a lot longer than you think. Things are gonna not work more times than they're gonna work, okay? And here's the really important thing. So I did my PhD for the first two years, my supervisor was so keen on this one project and it was a dead end. It just wasn't gonna work. And it took two years for me to convince him this is not gonna work and let me work on a different project. So this is important. You gotta know when to quit a project. You can see this is never gonna work. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and as I mentioned, things are gonna go wrong. Now, <laughs> this has some COVID implications. I don't wanna oh. touch on that too much. Well. <laughs> yes, yes. Also, when you're doing your research, one of the really important things is to keep up with all the new technologies, okay? Because that allows things to happen. So this shows, you know, where things are at. And if you don't have the technology to answer a question, you better move on. Okay, so uh, you're, now you've gone through your graduate studies and now you're ready to, to set up on your own. So typically you've done one or two postdocs. Uh, I did two, it, you know, it doesn't hurt because going from electron microscopy to coming with Connie, I realized my passion was in this new field, new field of uh, hemopoiesis and uh, the possibility of working and, and helping to cure leukemias and lymphomas. It was a very exciting, and things were very primitive compared to the way they are now. So the first thing you should do if you're trying to set up your own lab is you talk to your supervisor as a postdoc and you ask him, what can I take with me? Because if you can take something you've already published and worked on, you can hit the ground running in this new lab you're trying to set up. Setting up your new lab is the scariest time in your life. Okay. You think you had it tough as a grad student or as a postdoc. Well, you try to set up your own lab. Okay. Oops, always pressed the wrong button. There we go. So here we go. The first thing you want to do when you set up your own lab, don't rush. The one thing I would say that we don't have where we work now is we don't have our office in the lab. In our old bakery building next door, the office was in the lab. And the real advantage of that is by having your office in the lab, you get there early, you leave late, you set an example for the rest of the lab. And it was wonderful when I had my office in the lab, I would hear people saying, oh, do you think I should use this Tris buffer for blah, blah, blah? And you could hear them say, no, no, Tris buffer will kill your cells, use HEPIs, you know, that kind of thing you can interject. So although we don't have that, that's the one thing I asked for in the design for the new building. And of course we didn't get it. Anyway, there you go. So the important thing is getting that first person in your lab that's competent, okay? So this shows what happens when you hire the wrong Igor assistant <laughs> in your lab. Okay. Now what you should do if someone's applied to you and you wanna get the references, do not get just written references. 
you have to call the reference or see them in person because you got to see how they answer. You got to look into their eyes and say, if you had to say something negative or something that this person had to work on, what would you say? And you look at them because they want to do well by their people or they want to get rid of them. And uh, you got to be very careful who you bring into your lab because these people in your lab are going to make or break you. Okay. So be very careful. During that early time, when you're setting up, of course, if, especially in an academic setting, you have to teach. All the professors are, you know, they're loving a new person coming into the, the department because they're going to dump all their teaching load onto you. So although it is good for promotions to start teaching, it's very important, you also have to be able to say, no, uh, I can't take on everything. Also, when you're starting up, it's very good, I, although you never have time, to become a member of a grants panel. Usually you start off as a scientific officer where you just take notes or whatever on a grants panel. But it's very good to sit on a grant panel because you get to know what's called the mafia. Every discipline has their godfathers. Like I was the godfather of ship. I could sit on grants and people would have to make nice with me. Uh, same thing when you're on a grants panel, you get to know who the big honchos are in the field and you get to know them by sitting on the same grants panel as they are. And that's very good. So anyway, being in a lab, setting up your own lab is a very scary time. It's also important uh, that you don't get any prima donnas in your lab. As you can see here, gee, I don't know, the professor says, I guess if I had to choose between you, I'd say that Jerry's formula has the most hideous side effects. So again, what you want to cultivate in your lab is a collaborative atmosphere, not a competitive atmosphere. I've worked in labs where it's a very competitive. Two people may be given the same project in some labs. And the person that's, and so they sabotage each other, which is a horrible scenario. When I was down at UC Irvine, my professor was a very new professor, and they had hired five people in that department. And they were told after five years, only two would be picked to go to be kept, the rest would be tossed. And so those five people sabotaged each other. Can you imagine? Anyway. Wow. Horrible. That's so savage. that's just something to keep in mind. So as I mentioned, this is a very scary time when you're first setting up. This is one of my favorite car far side cartoons of all time. Anyway, not important. <laughs> 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 okay, so get good people in your lap. So the next thing is do not be wedded to a hypothesis. Now it's lovely to say, oh wow, you know, I bet this thing works this way. And I've known some brilliant people far smarter than me that have been wedded to a hypothesis and they've gone burning down to the ground, okay? So it's very important. It's nice to have hypothesis, but you have to follow the data. Reproducible data is what you follow, not your hypothesis. So the greatest obstacle to discovering the truth is being convinced you already know it. And as, uh, time and time again, you'll find in your research another beautiful hypothesis destroyed by an ugly fact. Oh. <laughs> or, and as Charles Darwin said, ignorance more frequently begets confidence than does knowledge, which is a lovely phrase. Okay, moving along. I have my notes here. Never read from your notes when you give a talk, by the way. <laughs> okay. Again, this is, I, I'm sorry if this is a bit sexist, and I apologize, but this is so funny. So believing is seeing. So this is a thing where you try to hang on to your hypothesis, even though the data is telling you differently. So this is one of the cutest things. Okay, sorry about this. Okay. All right. So that's <laughs> so to keep in mind, we tend to have blinders on if we, you know, if we see data that doesn't fit our hypothesis, we make excuses, yada, yada, yada. Don't grasp at straws. You have to know when to let a project go. 
So, and the last, okay. <laughs> so I don't care how smart you are, how good you are. You gotta be lucky. And that, you know, I've been very lucky. I've been, was very, I've been lucky throughout my career. When I was a graduate student, I was very unlucky. As I mentioned, the two years following a project. So when I was graduate struggling and I noticed some of my graduate student friends were publishing and going, they were out in no time. And I was there for nine years. I said, you know, if I'm ever lucky in the future, if I ever do well, I'm gonna keep my humility because then I'm gonna remember how much luck plays a role. So this is just an example. Great events in chemistry. Moments before his brilliant insight into the structure of ben benzene. As some of you should know, benzene is a six-membered ring. So this is actually very funny. Okay, <laughs> it's a, a little bit of an in-joke. So um, also important here is develop your speaking and writing skills. Now, when I first started, as you, like most of us, I was terrified and I was introverted. And so I actually took a Dale Carnegie course on uh, public speaking. And I developed this mantra I learned there. So instead of having a mantra where you're about to give a talk and you said, oh my God, I hope I don't screw up. I hope I don't screw up. Your mantra should be changed to, man, I love giving talks. And you'd be surprised you say that enough and you will, you know, you still have butterflies, of course, and you should when you're giving talks but it really will help. So speaking and writing skills. Okay, so when I was writing papers first back over 50 years ago, the concept was you write in the passive, most boring way you can. That was the, you never had we or I. It's once you finish your paper, you give it to another graduate student if they fall asleep reading it halfway through the paper, you know it's ready to go out. <laughs> Everything has changed now. Now it's more like a, an exciting novel. So you can uh, say something like, unexpectedly, when we express this mutant protein, my girlfriend got pregnant, okay? So I've given that as an example. So you can see the difference between something that's causative and something that's just Correlative. <laughs> all right. So again, I'm not going to go into all the details. Anyone wants to, any advice on how to write a paper? I'm sure your own supervisors are good at this too. You want a short and sexy title. You want a title that gives you the essence of the paper in a nutshell. You, and I've seen titles that are not good. Titles that say so-and-so affects so-and-so. That's not a good title. So it should be so-and-so increases or decreases. It should give you the essence of the paper. So again, I don't wanna waste too much time going through all this. Typically when you write a paper, you start with the figures, ordering the figures, you wanna start the results with a bang and end with a bang. It could either start with a biological observation or a mechanism of action and end the other way. Um, but again, make it exciting. All right. So lastly, I just want to talk about collaborating and networking. To survive today, you can't rely on just you and Igor in the lab anymore. There's just too much to know, too many techniques, and you can't have them all in your own lab. But what you want to do is you want to develop a technique or something in your lab that is relatively unique. So unlike the old days where you could survive by saying nothing and pretending that everything is look, this is one of my favorite slides. If you look at this carefully, you realize amongst the basset hounds is this fox <laughs> hiding in the pack. So that's one way to survive, just blend in. But you can't blend in if you're a scientist. You want to have something that others will want to collaborate with you on. Discovering something new, having a new technique, that kind of thing. Okay. 
All right, we're doing fine. A scientist has to stand out from the crowd to be successful. So what you want to do when you're starting out, you've come up with a nice paper, you want to present it at meetings, <clears throat> um, you want to attend small meetings. Don't go to the huge, huge meetings where you're just a dot in, in a 20,000 people. You want to go to small meetings like little keystone meetings or similar to that. Uh, and that way you can actually interact and meet people. Importantly, you want to meet the mafia. You want to meet the people that will be uh, reading you and reviewing your papers. And these are the, uh, the people you want to impress. Now, interestingly, when you go to meetings, this is a, a small aside, <clears throat> there's an unspoken dress code. If you go to a clinical meeting, you want to dress up, suit and tie. You'll be dealing with MDs, clinical meetings, it's a different set of people. You go to a molecular biology meeting, you want a torn t-shirt and torn jeans. Things may have changed since those days, but basically it's this only said that so it can feed into this cartoon. Suddenly Professor Leibowitz realized he has come to the seminar without his duck. So that just shows that different meetings have different uh, procedures. Not important. <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe I shouldn't have included that. <laughs> so again, develop your extroversion, extroverted behavior. Become friendly so you can attract collaborators. Give those good talks when you are at meetings so people will invite you back to give good talks. Giving a good talk is not just having great data. You also have to be an entertaining speaker because and I sit on committees where we decide who we're going to invite as speakers here, there, and everywhere. And people will say, well, that's good science, but he is a boring speaker. So remember that, you know, try and not only have a good talk, but make it entertaining. Okay. And um, again, Jerry, so yeah. what was the dress code for the cellular, cellular biologist then? Ah. Oh. Well, the important thing to know <laughs> is it's easier to dress down than dress up. Okay. <laughs> so uh, it's better to cover your bases and wear something really nice. Like, you know, for a guy, you can have a jacket and a tie. You can always take the tie and jacket off, but you can't, miss, you know, magically get it if you don't have it. So you can always have that torn pair of jeans in your suitcase, but it's better to come to a meeting if you don't know what it's like dressed up, you could always take things off. Okay, <laughs> great. <laughs> All right, so meetings are not only good to meet the mafia and get to know people and set up collaborations, but you can actually learn things at meetings as shown here. So the picture's pretty bleak, gentlemen. The world's climates are changing, the mammals are taking over, and we all have a brain about the size of a walnut. So you can learn things by going to meetings that might be really, really useful. So again, you go to meetings, you meet people, you set up collaborations that you can get more publications that way. You can get more grant money. Your lab can spiral up instead of spiraling down. And if you set up really good collaborations and that involves to some extent, putting your ego aside, setting up collaborations, you may not be the senior author or the first author, or, you know, but that's fine. Getting a lot of good publications is, is more important than having few publications with you being the senior author. Okay, and if you listen to what I've just said, <laughs> set up these great collaborations. This is my last slide. The sky's the limit. Okay. <laughs> All right, so I'll stop there. And if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Well, and if sure. anyone, anyone wants any advice down the road on writing a paper, I'm happy to, to give what advice I can. Great, thank you so much, Jerry. Um, we do have some questions in Slido. So, and actually I think like, I will start with one that is really at least interesting for me, which is what are your thoughts in equity, diversity and inclusion um, in research? I know your lab until recently, until Hossein joined, was an all girls lab. So, <laughs> um, what are your thoughts on this matter? 
We, it's so, you know, I've worked, as you know, in a lot of different labs, and I find people are the same everywhere. It doesn't matter. Uh, we're all the same. We're all equally bright and, and capable. And uh, what I should have mentioned earlier on, forgot, is that not only do you want to encourage a, your lab to be collaborative rather than competitive, and that goes with other lab, you know, collaborating with other labs as well. You want to, um, it, you know, when a, when a person does well in your lab and gets good results, they, they're, they deserve praise, but they already know they've done well. So they don't deserve encouragement as much as someone in your lab who's hitting a bit of a, a brick wall and not doing well. Those are the people that really need encouragement. And I've always believed in raising all boats. Everyone in the lab should be treated well. And you know, if someone's not working, that's different. But if they're trying and things aren't working, they need a lot of encouragement. And I always like to give people, graduate students, what I call a bread and butter project and a high risk one. So if the high risk one doesn't work out, the bread or butter one, they'll get their degree. Even if you only give a person a single project, you should give them a project that no matter what the result is, it's gonna be worthy of publication. You don't wanna be on a project where if it doesn't work at the end of three, four years, they got nothing. It should be, even if like they get a negative, you know, if this thing doesn't do something, that's still interesting. You know, that kind of thing, those kind of projects are much better. In terms of uh, gender, I, you know, I've worked in two labs where my boss has been a woman. I, I've certainly no problem with that. Uh, Connie's one of the brightest women I've ever known. I've met people from every country in the world and there's no one group of people that are better than another. You know, we're all the same. We all have the same anxieties. And so I am all for inclusivity, of course. I mean, it's not even a question for me. That's great. Awesome. I'll let JB introduce the next question. Um, the second one is interesting. Um, <laughs> it <laughs> might be a bit uh, of a tough question. Uh, how do you know when you have something big enough, let's say, that you would want to start a company with? That's a good question, and it's very hard. Now, I didn't mention this, but I did. I started a, a company called Aquinox based on SHIP, because SHIP was such a good target. It's only expressed in hemopoietic cells, so you can really use SHIP as a target to manipulate immune cells. So that was a huge thing, and, and we actually got into that. Now, uh, I learned a lot by uh, being a, one of the four founders of this company called Aquinox. It was, we raised a huge amount of money. We were one of the biggest biotech companies in Vancouver at one point in terms of money raised. Um, it, it can lead you down a very dark path because you have to raise money uh, from capital, uh, from investors, and uh, they're only interested in making money. And so, what happens when you start a company, if you have to raise money from these investors is you need to hire a CEO and that CEO, ours was very honest. He said, well, you know, after a while, you guys are gonna be kicked out, you know that. And indeed, after a couple of years, we, we were all let go and even scrubbed from the website that we <laughs> never were there. And uh, they didn't take our advice and they went too quickly into trials with the wrong molecule and they lost it all. So it, it's fraught with difficulty. So be very careful in deciding to go down that route. That's all I can say. I, I mean, of course, um, I have a question of my own. Um, from pretty much every person, every guest that we interviewed, uh, and we interviewed, you know, Connie, Alan, uh, Florian, and even people from Simon Fraser, they always talk about how even throughout time that whatever 
hasn't changed was that there's was never enough funding. Um, they always talk about the difficulty of acquiring funding, how there's not enough funding. Um, and that has always been something that is, is on their minds throughout their whole career. So um, what do you think uh, we as, you know, current and aspiring scientists, um, what could we do to um, try to initiate um, or push for more funding towards research uh, here in Canada? Yeah, that, that is a perennial problem. <laughs> now, there are some institutes around the world that have a different model from us. And I've always pushed for that. There's this new institute that started in London um, called the Francis Crick, from Watson and Crick Institute. And there they take young starting professors and they guarantee them research money for five years. So they don't have to write grants and worry about it. Five years, worry-free, enough money to have enough chemicals, enough people to get started on their career. After five years, they can renew for another five years without writing the grant. So 10 years, they can be there. The idea is it's a launching pad and you get enough publications and you know, and you're doing well enough, it's expected that you then leave. Yeah. So it's a wonderful, and I've been to the Crick Institute in London. It's an incredible place. It's huge. There's all these collaborative meeting rooms and it's a big open atrium. And it's, it's a model I like much better than we have here. I've always believed that if a university or research center hire someone, I mean, we've spent so many years training, we're ready to go. And then, as I mentioned, starting out as the scariest part of your life, because you know you have, even with a good um, starting up package, <laughs> when I started, mm -hmm. my startup <laughs> package was $600. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. It was enough to buy a secondhand lyophilizer so I could dry down my erythropoietin preparations from urine. It was, it was horrible. And uh, I don't wish that on anybody. Now, startup packages are much better. So when you're leaving your postdoc to start up your own lab, apply to as many places for a starting position as you can, because if you can get more than one place that's going to accept you, you can play them off against each other to negotiate a better starting up package and even a salary if you're, if you're lucky enough. Um, and having that initial cushion is a good idea, but there's a, there is a concern there. If you get a really generous startup package, you think, oh, fantastic. I'm gonna hire 10 people right away and get moving. Mm -hmm. That is the worst thing you can do. You wanna <laughs> take your time because getting those first few people in the lab, if they're not good, if they're not really interested in research and drag you down, you're doomed. It's better not to take on a lot of people right away it's better to do it really slowly, one person at a time. You get that first person in as a technician, a graduate student, postdoc, who's really good. The next person coming in will get their uh, philosophy from that first person. They see that person working really hard, really meticulous, keeping great notes. They'll do the same. If that first person's dreadful, sloppy, yada, 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 they will be too. So go slow, even if you get a good startup package. But again, I've always believed that if you're hired anywhere, it should come with a certain amount of money guaranteed for a certain number of years till you get your footing. Yeah, yeah. funding's yeah. always a worry. Um, oh, that's great, Jerry. Now I know the steps actually of what to do if I try to go into academia. <laughs> yeah. um, Mind you, going into industry is, you know, the pay is usually a lot, you know, double. 
when you go into industry. So a lot of you, oh, wow, why would I want to go into academia? But jobs are more uncertain in industry. You've got it. You know, I had a wonderful postdoc who went to uh, Eli Lilly in Indianapolis, very smart, helped with uh, uh, cloning of a ship, did a lot of great work. And she had come up with great uh, discoveries at Eli Lilly. But the lawyers do a search and they say, no, this isn't patentable. This isn't going to work. You got to drop it. And it was, it was very, you know, because she, she is used to publishing. And so she, when you go into industry, you got to give up that dream of publishing because they don't want you to publish <laughs> until they have all the patents in order, et cetera, et cetera. So, it, it, it has its own benefits and downside. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think we have time for at least one or two more questions. So um, there is an actually really interesting question, which is any advice on how to approach your own PI when you want to move on from a dead end project or idea? And, or how long should I try something before moving on? Yeah, that, that's tough because it depends on the personality of your supervisor and how uh, embedded he is into that idea. But the thing to do is uh, read the literature really well see if there's a project very similar to what you're doing that isn't working, a project that, that has a better chance of working and suggest that to the supervisor. You could even say, I certainly don't mind continuing on with this, but can I start this just in case this one doesn't work? We'll see what that person says. That's a delicate one, it's true. Yeah. It is really a delicate, yeah. Uh, next one is kind of, <laughs> it's a bit funny. Um, so how did you financially survive so long as a graduate student? Oh, as a graduate student? <laughs> well, um, I, I was lucky in that I became a very good tennis player and I taught tennis through graduate school. Oh made some money that way you got to be innovative sometimes <laughs> <laughs> i don't know i actually did hear that you played tennis oh so, yeah. very interesting yeah. yeah were you a good player back in the day well it's funny because <laughs> i i wasn't what's called a a killer player so if someone I was playing against wasn't doing well, I tried to help them out. So I didn't have that killer instinct. So uh, I couldn't see. go above a certain level because uh, yeah. I, I, I'm not ruthless. <laughs> <laughs> Always a big heart. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well um, I think that wraps up the questions uh, that we had today. Um, again, this was a fantastic presentation, uh, lots of good, uh, <laughs> panels to laugh at and sort of, um, I enjoy the cartoon so much, Jerry. Oh, thank you. <laughs> if you want any, if anyone wants any of the cartoons, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> Fingers crossed for these spiders. Um, <laughs> um, but yes, thank you so much. Uh, this was incredibly helpful. Um, kind of we definitely gained a lot more insights and um, hopefully to everybody else, they also um, have a lot to gain from you. Um, and I mean, we hope you never stop. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hope to see you around through the rest of my degree and many others um, so that, you know, you can do more of this. Um, so thank you, Jerry, um, sincerely. And um, to everybody for coming. Um, and to anybody that wants to listen to this again, um, and for others that couldn't tune in today, we'll send the video link out Our so that they can listen anytime. If you want to listen. Me too, that would be great. Yeah. 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 <laughs> of course. Yeah. I'd like great. to thank you, JB and Laura. And I, I, 
I'd like to thank you both for organizing this. I think it's it's a very nice thing to have. Oh, thank you. <laughs> we thought of this idea because of, um, you know, hearing stories of everybody and how they got to their careers and what they had to do and what their philosophies are. It's, it's that itself is a story apart yeah. from their own and research. And I thought that was it's really motivating and inspiring to hear you you know sometimes as graduate students you're put in a rough spot and you're like oh but it's not working and then you realize that your pis and senior people that are actually like really well known had the same struggles it was it keeps us motivated as well yeah, yeah. I, I can tell you all of us all the pis we all have scars we <laughs> we've all <laughs> rough times and Big disappointments, papers rejected. Uh, you just got to keep going. Yeah. yeah. It's indeed. And but we hope to see you around again. Uh, hope this I, pandemic I hope will it's over and, soon. Yeah, let you come back to your <laughs> office. <laughs> and okay. take care. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Again, thank you so and much for take coming. care, everybody. Yeah. Take, everybody, take care.